Welcome to Earth, a love story. I'm your host, Robin Lassiter. If you're new here, you can start with the first episode, Preface, and listen to me read you my entire book, also titled Earth, a Love Story, which will be published this summer. After I finished reading the book, I decided to shift the podcast to conversations with wild and weird artists, experiencers, addicts in recovery or not, and other fringe folk that make up the endlessly diverse tapestry of gorgeous humanity expressing itself on this planet. If you've enjoyed this podcast and would like to support my work, please leave a rating and review on Apple and Spotify. Today we have another experiencer episode. Jim joins us to share his story as a lifelong experiencer of various paranormal phenomena who only recently started to work through his experiences. Jim shares with us not only what he's been through, but how his life has changed and what he's done in response to these events that don't fit into consensus reality. Jim is warm and funny and grounded, and I very much enjoyed our conversation together. I hope you do too. So I thought when you said what the format would be, that I would try to focus more on not what happened, but how I felt Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, tell it in a uh, Tarantino-esque start in the middle, go back to the beginning, work back to the end. Yeah. And then uh, the ultra violent climax. Oh, (laughs) pity. That's uh, a barring the ultra violent climax. That's, um, my book you know i started at the i started at like three quarters the way through and then went back to the beginning and then caught up with myself at like chapter 10 and then finished the story so i get it yeah and that makes sense because you kind of figure out your shit in the middle right right you know and there's just you know 18 plus years of what is this right and then your life keeps going so once you sort of get the narrative and make sense of it, it doesn't stop happening. And so then the story sort of continues from there. Right. Yeah. Brilliant. That makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. I thought a good place to start was senior year, high school prom weekend. Mm -hmm. Like that's a pretty massive moment in most suburban kids lives. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I had a friend group that's about, you know, a dozen or so kids. And we went to the prom. We kind of split up and did after prom activities. I went to a beach house. Some kids went to a lake house. Some kids, I don't know what they did. But Sunday night, everybody was filtering back to our hometown. And it was revealed that within our friend group, there had been a love triangle and Mm. it was exposed and it blew apart our friend group. I was about a month removed from it being a love square. (laughs) So I had a new girlfriend and I felt like it didn't really affect me, but it did, you know, especially I was concerned for my other friend that was affected. So out of those dozen kids, we all kind of blew apart and landed in factions. That Sunday night, I met up with uh, two friends, but really just one at first. And we were kind of just, right, if I'm gonna stay true to the Tarantino thing, I drove my car over to a park. It's a Mustang, I had the radio on. So it was, <laughs> it was the year, uh, year 2000, right? So that puts you in a, in a time. Mm-hmm. So Incubus or something like that must've been on the radio. Mm-hmm. So I pulled up to a park at dusk and we were going to hang out on a playground structure after dark, like suburban kids do. Uh, her and I were friends, but to that point we weren't very tight. Like we didn't know like each other's really deep secrets, you know, and talking about this, she was looking to see if I was okay. Mm-hmm. Um, we talked about what happened and kind of got to the point where it just was quiet feeling like totally safe with her, like realizing that she's like textbook ride or die. Like she would 
kill somebody if they did me wrong. Mm-hmm. I felt totally open and trusted trusted her. Uh, I I asked her. I was like, "Hey, can I ask you something? Like, or just kind of tell you something? Um, kind of weird." And she's like, "Yeah, dude. What?" And I was like, "Ah, uh, I. This sounds crazy, but I think, like, since I was a little kid, like, aliens have been fucking with me." And I remember, like, kind of getting that feeling in my stomach, like, "Oh fuck!" Like, I just exposed myself as a fucking lunatic. And she was like, dude, that's not crazy. She's like, do you want to talk about it? And I was like surprised. I was like, wow, yeah. Yeah. And I had never talked about it. I had never mentioned it to anybody. I never even confronted that being a a truth Mm -hmm. up to that point. So I think like naturally we just started talking about some of the memories that I had as a really young kid and how weird they were. Um, you know, a lot of the emotions that I've had as an experiencer from the beginning is fear and confusion, Mm -hmm. right? And that just breeds more fear when you don't understand what's going on and feeling powerless. The earliest memory is from the crib. I, I remember standing up. It was nighttime. I shared a room with my mom. Uh, standing up in the crib, looking over to her side of the room. She was not in the room, but in the room above her bed on the wall, you know, about three quarters of the way up, I saw what I perceived as a, you know, one and a half year old, maybe two year old, um, the moon on on the wall. Uh, It was just like a pale white light. And I was transfixed on it. I didn't know what it was. I just, I thought it was the moon. And that the memory is the moon on the wall. As I got older and I I thought about it uh, more, I still don't know what it is or what it was. I wonder sometimes if it wasn't two dimensional, if it was actually an orb, because that's common. I didn't know if it was a portal. It may have been not a portal anywhere other than the other side of the wall. And I say that because skipping ahead six years, I had weird dreams. Uh, you know, you could explain them as just, you know, night childhood nightmares, but they stuck with me and they still, I still remember them. There's quite a few to go through them quickly. There was one where I was above And it sounds like being out of body now, Mm -hmm. but I was above looking down at a, a big room full of people, adults. Uh, My mom was one of them. And there was a person that was kind of leading them around this room and through a doorway. And they, they were, they were moving like robotically, like they weren't reacting. And I remember like kind of trying to get my mom's attention and I couldn't. There was something that they were giving to the people. Like to me, it looked like a cracker and it would make them turn into what I thought were actual robots. And the nightmare part is that I was really upset that my mom was going to be turned into an actual robot. You know, take that as just a weird dream. Um, I, I know little kids that are four years old are aware of robots. That's how they would perceive somebody acting robotically. I don't, I don't know if that was really a paranormal dream. I don't know if it was just a weird dream, but it stuck with me still to this day. I can remember it vividly. Other ones just being chased by tall monsters, figureless shadow, wide shoulders, uh, the shape of a head on wide shoulders. Weird. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know what to think of those. But we moved through six years or so to the point where I'm seven, and I lived with my mom and my grandparents at the time. My grandparents watched TV. It was the uh, premiere of Unsolved Mysteries. It featured the the Roswell story. I haven't gone back and watched it, but I'm sure there must have been some representation or some rendering of Grays. When I saw that, I snapped and was immediately fearful and 
told my grandmother that I was scared. That that is scary. It was abnormal. Uh, you know, as a child of the eighties, you know, kids movies were slasher movies. You know, everybody had an older older sibling or a cousin that showed them Chucky and right. And I remember being afraid of Chucky and Freddy Krueger, but not for long. You know, got over it. I realized Chucky's not going to come get me. Whatever. This though, it never went away. That night, she told me they're fake. The Air Force said they were crash test dummies. They weren't real. Aliens aren't real. You need to take a shower and get ready for bed. I refused to take a shower because what I said was, they're going to pull me through the wall. They're going to grab me and take me through the wall. I don't know where that came from. I don't know what memory I had. I don't know if there's anything in movies that represented that. I, I don't know. I just know that that's where that fear immediately was triggered. I remember vividly being in the bathroom, taking a shower, and in the shower stall, it's so claustrophobic, I had like nowhere to run, no, nowhere, no way to get away from it. I made her stay up with me as I tried to go to sleep. I woke up, saw she wasn't there, like, <laughs> raised a fit. And that pattern of me not being able to go to sleep continued until I was about 13 years old. And I found ways to cope and I had a TV in my room and I could leave infomercials on and keep myself up. It, it, it was just a way to cope. You know, every night since it goes through my mind at least once that something can happen. I'm powerless against it. Uh, as, as a kid, I'd, I'd lay in bed and slow my breathing, hide under the blankets and not breathe because I thought they could see me or sense me if I was breathing. Around teenage years, I started having dreams. And I knew that they were, that they meaning like I, the phenomenon grays, I don't know. But I, I had the feeling that they were showing me something, that they were trying to show me something. It was mechanical. It was 3D representations of some type of schematic or machine. Uh, it was it was very simple, but I didn't I couldn't understand what they were trying to show me. There was a, a model of three balls orbiting one another, and the pair that were off to the side kind of influenced the one that was in the middle. And to me, there was something about a, a, a force and a way to control it. And I thought, is this like the principle behind how UFO works? I, I didn't know what it meant. Mm -hmm. I tried to explain that to a physics teacher and he was like, yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. And I just kind of left it there and thought I was just having crazy dreams. I did wake up from some dreams and was drawn to the window and I would see lights in the sky. I remember one time I fell asleep right after school and woke up while it was still daylight and went to the window and saw a like rectangular vertical looking craft over my neighbor's house. I had a few instances around that time of what's called sleep paralysis I, somehow my window would be open and i i could see the my curtains blowing you know i'm looking around with my eyeballs not moving my head i had a been in, in an art program at the time i would draw and paint and everything i had a drafting table right beside my bed with a, an articulated lamp you know when i when i explain this it's the kind of lamp from the pixar all right so when this happened it was at least three or four years before Pixar. So I know that that didn't influence me, but the first time I saw a Pixar movie, I kind of said, I was like, that, that thing is fucked up. Mm -hmm. Because that's how my articulated lamp looked at me. It just, you know, raised itself up, and then the cone of the lampshade just looked at me and got in my face. And it was horrifying. 
So what I'm getting at is that just a lot of weird things happened. I I wasn't so lucky to have an alien show up and say, this is what we're doing. I need you to do this. It was just weird, horrifying things. And the teenage years started peppering in the ghosty poltergeist kind of things that always had some level of deniability to them. Like maybe I just heard something, maybe it was in my head. Uh, that goes for all of these things. I always have that. Maybe I imagined it, maybe it was in my head, maybe I dreamt it, maybe it's not real. But with this ghost stuff, it was always, maybe I didn't hear that, maybe I didn't see that until um, I was home alone one night and I grilled a steak and I used a big knife in the kitchen to kind of cut it up and I left the knife on the stove and walked through the dining room into a living room, sat and ate, watched TV. When I went back to the kitchen to put my plate in the sink, that knife was in a potted plant in the dining room that I had walked through. And I was like, all right. I just had the feeling like, okay, all everything leading up to this that I was just saying like, oh, this is bullshit. It's like it was saying like, like, explain this. <laughs> I had that feeling of like, explain this. And it was intimidating. It was a knife. It was sticking out of the plant, straight up out of the dirt. So I grabbed it and I kind of said something to the effect of like, go fuck yourself. Right. And threw it in the sink. And then tough guy, I retreated to the front porch and called my grandma <laughs> to talk about baseball or something because it was, it was on TV at the time. But I was, I was scared. I was shook. Somewhere around my early 20s, like college age, it just stopped. I'd still think about it occasionally, but I, it had been so long since I had any type of weird experience that life just kind of went to normal. And uh, I kind of just I made it, it made it even more clear to me that that was all just BS, that, that all didn't happen. And maybe I was just a weird kid that thought I was seeing ghosts and aliens. I had built out a studio or helped some two friends build out a studio in one of the friends' basement. It was a lot of fun. I was in this basement for hundreds of hours with other kids recording projects, actually building it. You know, there's two isolation rooms, a main room a live room rather, and a control room. I picked out the paint colors. It was very fun. I was happy down there. I knew his parents very well. I was really comfortable in this house. What I'm getting to is that one night when I was left alone in that house, coiling up cables, because everybody had either gone home or my friend was taking his girlfriend home and coming back, uh, I had a really frightening experience of being in that basement. I was standing in front of my amplifier and I was coiling up some cables and immediately over my shoulder, there was a storage room that didn't have a door on it yet and was dark. And I felt something from that part of the room just on me, just like I was prey. And I stopped and the hair raised on my neck and arms. And I heard the cliche, get out. Um, but it wasn't that clear. It was like, go away, get out angrily all at once. So I still feeling like I was locked in the gaze of a predator. I slowly put the cable down on top of my amplifier and said out loud, okay. And I purposely kept my hands out in front of me and took slow steps because I felt as if I just booked it up the stairs, it would just trigger that predator chase reaction. And uh, I, I wouldn't be able to outrun it. So I slowly and calmly, so my hands out in front of me, walked up the stairs 
creaky ass old stairs until I got to a mud room that connected to the kitchen and I could see through the house, the front door. I was going towards the front door. I felt a little bit of relief being upstairs. You know, my brain immediately is going, oh, that wasn't, that was nothing. That was another gym. You just got creeped out. But then I saw their dog and they had a big, mean, bully breed dog who was a sweetheart. But he was growling in the dining room at the floor. He was looking through the floor to where that storage room was. And I said the dog's name and I was like, come on, come on, like, let's go. And him and I sat in the front yard until my friend came home. My friend came home at the same time as his parents and they saw me in their front yard with their dog. And wouldn't you know it, they knew why. And, uh, Hey, that's why the house is for sale. Please don't say anything to anyone. So they already had this whole uh, history of being around this presence, this entity, whatever the fuck it was. It didn't like anybody and it made it clear. And I was, totally receptive to it. And at that time I was powerless against it. I had no type of protection. I had no idea that I could stand up to this thing. I was a, a, a squirrel and it was a Bengal tiger. So they kind of reintroduced me to the idea of paranormal experiences. And it, it, it scared me, but nothing else happened immediately after i moved a couple states away and i think that thing followed me and i started having some of the alien uh dreams again there was a, a night where i was in bed and that thing i believe from that basement was in my room above me i could see it it was, my entire ceiling was blackness and it was dripping and like a, like a, if you like melted the ceiling and it just came down in one bulb, it just came down right to my head and it was putting pressure on my head. Um, if you like strain your jaw, you can kind of make like this, like bass rumble in your ears. And that was all I could hear. That's all that was like happening was I just felt this pressure on my ears. And um, it forced me to confront it. It's funny now as I'm telling the story, I'm thinking about it. I, I think that may have been the purpose. I don't know. It's weird, but I confronted it, you know, in my own way by out yelling it by being louder and telling it to fuck off and that that thing retreated and it left me alone but it never really went away it just left me alone at that same time the neighbors that i had we were in a duplex their young daughter started having night terrors which i is common but when i see it line up with my experiences i kind of felt like that had something to do with it the alien dreams were still present. I got to the point when I was about 27 years old, 25 maybe, where uh, the idea of confrontation, I felt like that was my out. I felt like I had learned. I had figured out on my own this way to put myself in a protective bubble. And it's funny, like I, I tell it now, when they made the, uh, the Peter Jackson made the newer Hobbit movies around that time, Gandalf fights the necromancer in Dolgador, and he's like in a white bubble. And I remember being like, yes, that's, you know, he knows that. And I was like telling my wife, I'm like, he knows that. That's my trick. I do that. It's like, fuck yeah, Gan. Yeah, cool. So I was very into this idea of confronting the phenomenon and I would go for walks at night and uh, say, you know, like, come at me, bro, like show yourself 
what is this? Like, what's your fucking deal? Why? And uh, enough of that. And I think it happened. I woke up. I was alone. My wife was sleeping on the couch for no good reason. We didn't fight or anything. She just sometimes slept on the couch. But I was alone. Woke up. Was drawn to the window. Uh, It was nighttime. I looked out the window. And a ball that looked like it was maybe softball size, maybe bigger. It was kind of hard to tell. But it was orange. It was pale. It looked fuzzy. And it was lit from inside. And it moved very much like a bubble, like um, like soap bubbles. It kind of drifted one way, would stop, kind of descended one way, stop again. It, it meandered. I kind of got the feeling that it wasn't threatening. But it went from above my neighbor's house to the tree outside my window and then settled. Like, I don't remember really if it settled in the grass or if it just disappeared before landing in the grass outside my window. But as it did, I heard in my head, and it wasn't my, my, you know, inside voice. It was just a generic voice. And it said, turn around. And I was going to. And then it said, I don't know if it said it like, you're not going to like what you see, or if it reacted to my emotion and said, you're not going to like what you see. But in that moment, I was turning um, around to my, my right side, I think, instinctually because my dominant hand is the left and I was balling up my fist and was going to take a swing at whatever was behind me at that moment. And as I did, when I got my neck around to see what's there swinging, I saw a torso that, it was shoulders, arms, torso, a brown or orange kind of color, a tight, I don't know if it was skin or some outfit, but it was like brown or orange in color. And that was in the darkness of like the light pollution, ambient light that you get in a city. And it wasn't fully like there it was like out of phase it was kind of fuzzy and transparent and uh i swung through nothing and just as it i say it i was i was being put out and right before i went out i heard all at once you're done or it's done something to the effect of this is this is done and um woke up the next morning sideways in bed my tv was on i didn't go to sleep with it on uh i was always a early riser it was 10:30 in the morning and i felt like junk and i woke up with the same you're done, it's done, in my head from the, from the night. And uh, it was like a good 10 years went by. I remember during that time or shortly thereafter, you know, Googling anything I could to see if anybody else was still having these things. I read a lot about like the mid 80s, early 90s, abductee spree or whatever you want to call it around the you know lower part of new york to new jersey you know ufo flap i found some more information about it was really the first time i started researching 
before that, there's way too much fear. You know, for instance, when Fire in the Sky came out, hell no. You know, even knowing today that like that wasn't Travis Walton's actual experience, the idea of that and seeing that, you know, I, I, I remember maybe watching it on HBO after a while and uh, just the scenes of him losing his shit under a kitchen table was like, no, can't do this. They stayed away from it. Whitley Strieber, I'm sure he's a nice guy. But man, that book cover, and it was on every end cap in Walden Books or whatever the bookstores were in the 90s. It was always there, and it would scare the crap out of me. So I had never researched. I had never really looked into it until the you know early 2010s, maybe. And there, there's still. I don't think there was a lot to go on then. There was. I mean, I remember being captivated by Project Serpo, but never thinking it was real. You know. So there was a lot of make believe there's a lot of fantasy there were some cool coast to coast am episodes you could find you know but even then i felt like the majority of that was entertaining at most that 10 or so years of quiet stopped and i when it came back the experiences were much more vivid and much more wild and urgent I think is a good good way to put it. Different, I guess it's the modes of contact now is the way to put it. I had no knowledge of what out of body meant. I had no knowledge of what the astral realm is. I, I you know, short of Doctor Strange comics, I didn't know what's going on. I started having dreamlike experiences of being taken out of body and they 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 weren't in my face they weren't always in my room but they were somewhere and it was like a game it was like find us and i'd be pulled out of myself and i would center over my backyard i have a large backyard and it's, it's private um, my backyard became a location for sleep just as much as my bed, it seemed. And I would see them, and I say them, the greys, out on the border of the property or kind of just standing near a, a tree line. And there'd be two. And for some reason, I would think there was another one. and the task or game or my fear was that there is a third one and I have to find it. And I don't know, I don't know where it is. I'd feel played with because I didn't know if they knew I was there. I would kind of position myself, myself like off their like rear corner over the shoulders and they would just be motionless. To like not give me any cues that happened um a bunch of times and uh i'd wake up not necessarily f fearful anymore but frustrated i'd say frustration was the uh major emotion you know and it, this this came at a time period in my life that was pretty okay so i can't really say that there was any external forces kind of making me have you know what i would describe as a, a a sleep problem i'm always trying to rationalize i'm always skeptical i'm always trying to prove what's going on a close friend of mine is a medium and we started talking about what she had been experiencing her whole life, but really started to pay attention to it and kind of stretch those muscles out in practice. And I told her my experiences and she was like, yeah, dude, that's, that's happening. 
specifically some precognitive dreams that I was having that, you know, when they panned out, they, they panned out and it's undeniable. And just for instance, one of my, you know, my parents died in my late twenties and, uh, I had a dream that I was just hanging out with my dad. It was very much a day with my dad. It was just as impersonable and small talk and just driving around town, grunting and understanding each other. But he was showing me all the storm damage in my town, like from some thunderstorm or something, um, flood damage, and just kind of be like, oh, yeah, that sucks. Wow. Yeah, so whatever. And then two weeks later, Hurricane Sandy did exactly those things to my town. I've had a couple of dreams where I'm in this place where there's people that are dead that I know, acquaintances from a long time ago, just a, it's a community area. It's actually a cafeteria at a YMCA in the city. And uh, somebody showed up there. They all said, hey, you know, this guy, I don't want to say their name, you know, but I knew who it was. It was a close friend's dad who I hadn't seen in 20 something years and uh, he's at the uh, he's at the he's at the cafeteria at the ymca and two weeks later i saw an announcement on facebook that he had been dead or he died but he had been in a coma for two weeks so it kind of makes me makes me wonder you know and my friend the medium she was like yeah don't deny it like you're picking up something there's something there there's something to it and then I started to kind of be honest with myself and not default skeptical, this can't be. I think I was doing that as like a tool, as self-preservation to not completely lose my shit. But I didn't. I didn't lose my shit. I started looking back at things, but still had like no idea what was going on. So now, to cap off the uh, Quentin Tarantino experience, it's pandemic time i'm driving around looking for used bookstores goodwill anywhere i can find piles of used vinyl from estate sales that became one of my pandemic hobbies i threw on a podcast and just typed in ufo and just started kind of thumbing through not really being into any of the imagery or titles i started seeing some like familiar like famous stories and i was like ah, nothing great i stopped it something that must have said experiencer something along those lines i didn't know what experiencer referred to at that point i listened to the podcast and wouldn't you know it robin lassiter was a guest so as robin's telling her story I'm saying to myself, holy shit, there are so many little nuanced, detailed things, just enough to make me think, are we in the same program? Whatever it was, is this like, wait a minute, what is this? I pulled over into a mall parking garage because I like to sit there up in the mall parking garage i can see the horizon that's another coping mechanism i need to get somewhere high and see the horizon or i need to be at a beach and see the horizon and i can clear my mind i don't feel confined i sat in the parking garage listened to the whole podcast and at the end robin mentioned the experiencer group so i let that sit for a while because it sounded really dumb but i was so intrigued by the little details that were triggering that i said let me take a look so i did i joined um i guess pretty early on in what the experiencer group was lurked maybe a couple months I wanted to make sure that it wasn't a cult, and um, I still do, um, because I think the famous last words of a cult member are, it's not a cult. There's no way. This is too good, right? 
whether or not it's a cult, it has given me so much context and it's given me such a place to share and receive other people's shares that it has just given me a bigger picture. So, right, the root of the fear is the powerlessness and the unknown. I've gotten to a place where it's hard to just explain because it was an evolution. And I think you have to live it to, to evolve that way. But where I am now, there's very little fear. There's still maybe some anger. There's maybe some frustration that you're not in total control. But I see what it's done to me. And I see that the, the change in me, in my personality, and in how my, my worldview over the years who I am is a result of this, of whatever the phenomenon is doing. And I stopped caring about what the phenomenon even is. I only look at how it's changed me. And I think it's changed me for the better. So ultimately, that's how I deal. Uh, Yes, weird things still happen. But I think I'd be pretty bummed if they didn't. At this point, I think that would suck. I think we have an arrangement between myself and the phenomenon. I think uh, I tolerate it. I go. I fall back on an analogy that I, I use all the time. I have two cats. Well, they died. Sorry to bum everybody out. But let's say I, I still have two cats for the sake of this. One of them, when we bring them to the vet or to the groomer, is a big Maine Coon mix, double pod. She's great. Jupiter. The groomer, the vet, whoever. When I go to pick her up, she's not even in her carrier. She is out and about, just chilling on the floor, chilling on a piece of furniture. And they all say, we love Jupiter. She's the best. She lets us groom her. She doesn't care. She's so great. Isn't she great? Yes. And then I notice their arms. And it's like, wow, you're, what cat did that? Because they've got scratches everywhere. I'm like, oh, yeah, uh, her brother Mittens, not so much. He is not as much of a, a willing participant. Uh, he ra- he raises hell. So for the majority of my life, I was mittens. I wasn't being hurt. I wasn't being held against my will for too long. However you want to equate it. I just, I, I raised hell. I gave, I gave the vet a hard time. And I kind of wound up like Jupiter. I'm sure she doesn't like it, but she tolerates it and she's better off for it. So here we are. Oh, thank you so much. I have so much. As you, I don't know. I think you know this. Um, Anytime I hear an experiencer, there are so many little things just all the time, you know, that resonate. And I, have, I, mean, I just um, got to say, I have to say real quick mm-hmm, yes. um, to that. When I heard the early episodes of your podcast, of your book, mm-hmm. um, they were great. It was the perfect thing to drown out the news channel at the gym. I could listen to your podcast and just, just it would make a half hour treadmill trip just vaporize. It was great. Um, the second episode was like some lost writings of Tolkien that have been never, you know, never released. Right? So like, that was pretty, that was pretty bitching. I was into that. But then, you know, you got to a point where like, you're like, um, I have a mission and it was like this, like, I don't know if he's a teacher guide kind of right. Something mm-hmm. along those lines. And I was like, well, yeah, like here I am, mm-hmm. you know, you, you pointed me in this direction, mm-hmm. you know, inadvertently. I'm sure I was pointed in this direction, doing exactly what you did going through and looking for a podcast. I don't even remember. I I truly can't remember how I stumbled on Stuart Davis's podcast, but it was a similar experience. I was like, holy shit, these people are talking about my life. 
And I didn't even know it was a thing. I had no idea it existed. Yeah, it's weird. And it's it's almost, I think of it, I really do. It's like a, a switch was flicked on. You know, it's like a, dealing with it yeah. the whole life, you know, my whole life, your whole life. And then all of a sudden there's this activation sort of thing. And here we all are in this group and suddenly there's context and suddenly uh, the fear that we've dealt with our entire lives has a framework and I, it's, I don't understand it, but that's part of how I conceptualize it. It's like time for this to happen now, you know? Yeah. I think the frustrating and impossible thing is trying to understand it, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, what it is, who it is, why it is all, you know, yeah all the w's it's <laughs> it's it's where it's led you right and it's how you've changed i don't know if it's like something that's like you know preparing us for whatever major event you know is prophesized by every you know religion out there or if it's really just to like make us all less of a dick <laughs> you know like just the worst of humanity like just chill out on that and it's incrementally that that's what it's been chipping away at yeah yeah how uh successful are you at pushing the all the w's away the y the i forget the w other w's (laughs) yeah Uh, pretty good right now but you know to be to to think of it honestly it's just because of the frustration of, well, they're not going to get anywhere with that. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, like uh, everything going on with the, um, what do they call it now? The UAPs. UAP. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or, or they changed it to UAP. Right. right. That, so I could, it's interesting and I'll keep paying attention, but it's at arm's length mm-hmm. because I don't know if that's even like, what's going on with me no i don't know if right. like i don't know if like i've ever interacted with a tic tac i don't i just don't think so mm-hmm. yeah I don't, it's, I, don't, I don't i don't know what that's about right i mean as you were talking i was thinking about my experiences and how i never said the word alien or ufo or any of that until this switch was flipped on. I don't think I'd have to really think about that. Um, No, that's not true. I did call it alien school before that, but there was a long time where it was just like stuff happening, you know, and now there's a, there is a cultural framework building for it. And I don't know quite how to feel about that. (laughs) Like as soon as it's getting, becoming like a system, I'm like, I don't know because it's too slippery like the phenomenon is too slippery I don't know that it can be contained in that and uh, yeah to that like I definitely knew what an alien was I knew what a gray mm-hmm. the representation of a gray was by you know around the time I must have been 10 I'm mm-hmm. sure you know it's 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 out there in mm-hmm. imagery yeah I so I did associate it I did what was going on with me until I actually saw them like to the point where I was like, like, that's what I'm seeing. But now you, you question if the phenomenon presents itself differently to different people mm-hmm. in different ways. So then, there again, I just question it, and I'm skeptical, and I don't know. I yeah. don't know. Right, and that's to me no the hallmark of uh, some sort of deep authenticity in this world is being like, I don't know. Because every, I think, you know, I could probably list every experience or I know, and they're all skeptics. I'm a skeptic. Like I yeah. second guessed myself. That's actually a huge part of my story was like how many years I gaslit myself and how many years I said, you're crazy. This isn't true. Don't tell people about this while also secretly harboring this real love for it. You know, this real, like, yeah. like you said at one point, like, don't go away. But don't get too no, close. No. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's why. So I recently um, had this desire to start a podcast, mm-hmm. and in coming up with a title for it, I wanted to sum up 
me in short order. I wanted to come up with a title that was who I am. And I came up with the clueless experiencer because that's just it. You boil it down and I have no idea what is going on. Yeah. Yeah. I have no, no clue. I love it. But I've experienced it. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. And I love one of my f- favorite parts. Of, this is the first time I've heard your story in its entirety, but I've heard bits and pieces. And one of my favorite parts always is the go fuck yourself and the fuck you and get the fuck out of <laughs> and here. I'll, and <laughs> and I'll, I'll beat you with a hammer. Right. right. Like I'm going yeah, to take a swing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I love it. Actually, I really do love it because it several times has reminded me that even though we're in this weird, liminal, ambiguous, we can't pin anything down, there is agency, you know, and, Mm -hmm. you know, facing that thing that came out of the ceiling and meeting it, which I can't, you know, I've, I've been that I've been in terror and I know how hard is hard it is to muster agency and like effort and resistance to that. It's, it's one of the hardest things. One of the hardest things I've ever done is get up out of bed when I yeah. just want to be cowering and f- completely yeah. frozen, like override yeah. that stand up, walk around the room and be like setting boundaries. It's so hard. Yeah. 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 yeah totally. Yeah. 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 That, that statement hit so hard that I'm uh, speechless right now. I just forgot mm. <laughs> what, where we were going in this conversation. <laughs> But that, yeah, that a hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, I haven't been kind of uh, creeped out in a while, but your story, I did get just like maybe two hairs stood up on the back of my neck, but two, <laughs> there was yeah. a couple. <laughs> yeah. 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 How did you feel about like one of my questions and it's a really tender aspect of this for me, but hearing, you know, and who knows, right? Like, we don't know if it's a one-to-one or not, but hearing about the neighbor's daughter getting night terrors and thinking about kind of the hitchhiker effect and the people in our lives that we love that may be affected by these things. Do you, what do you, what, do you, what are your thoughts about that? Have you had to deal with that other than that? Instance? You know what? There's, it's, it's not so bold. Um, I'm not so strong. Mm. Um, I'm, you know, it's happened to my stepdaughter mm. as well. When I hear my neighbor's kid crying, I just tell myself, like, you know, pediatricians say that between the ages of two and four, mm. it's, it's very common to have night terrors, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but when my daughter was between the ages of two and four, she came into our room one morning and very matter of factly declared, I want you to throw away my lamp. Mm. And we're like, why now? Like, you want to, you want a Hannah Montana lamp? What? A princess lamp? What? What do you want? She's like, my lamp looked at me last night and I don't like it. And I want you to get rid of it. When she said that, my stomach dropped because I had a lamp experience myself. Right. And I just said, oh no, they're, they're fucking with her. Yeah. And I, I stopped thinking about it and I put it out of my mind because I thought maybe I influenced that mm. by considering it right. and I wanted to protect her. And then I, I was afraid. So I just was like, put it out of mind. Mm-hmm. Um, another time shortly after that, same thing in the morning, she came into her room and she mm-hmm. said, the mushrooms came into my room last night and they looked at me and they look at me like this. And she opened her eyes really wide and tightened her lips and just made a gray face. Mm. Right. The, yeah, the yeah, classic, yeah. the Whitley Streber book cover. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. So that traumatized us all. Yes. That. <laughs> Yeah, she did that. And then I started thinking on it. And it was the last time she said it, though. There's nothing after that. And I thought, they must be checking her out. You know, a lot of people speculate about genetics and families being linked together with experiences. Um, She wasn't my biological kid. 
Mm-hmm. So I think they were just like, what's this uh, unsanctioned kid doing here? And they were just, just heck checking her out. She has no memory of it. She's mm-hmm. nothing. Though it didn't it's, continue. It, mm-hmm. it started and stopped right there. Yeah. And that's just what I speculate. Yeah. Is they're just checking on things. Mm-hmm. My biological mm-hmm. daughter, that's, she's, there's no other way to put it. She's, where I'm trying to get to, and then another step. Mm-hmm. She's so chill about this stuff. She she's had a lot of paranormal stuff, but she doesn't wouldn't even consider it that. She just mm-hmm. tells me about the dream she has, and she has no fear of it. Wow, that's a blessing. Yeah. So it, it yeah just take it yeah just take it exactly as that as a blessing that it's just something that is happening and she's okay with it Mm -hmm. it's a it's a tough part of it for me because i have had a few experiences that involve family and loved ones and it is i don't know what to do with it and it uh and there's not anything i mean what you said kind of at the beginning about contextualizing like here's the experiences but what is really interesting and important not that they aren't interesting and important but what you did with them like how we cope and also how they how it has changed us and i'm i can't help but ask i know it's kind of the opposite of what you've said like you know you kind of give up on trying to understand what this is about but i do wonder like do you have do you feel like like I'll tell you my sort of cosmology that I've put this in. And if you have one as yeah. well, Go ahead. But, yeah, yeah. Like there's, you know, the Fae and there's um, elemental beings and there's poltergeist activity and there's ETs and there's extra dimensional stuff. And there's all of the parts and pieces and chaos inside my own psyche. <laughs> and there's everybody on earth and there's collectives. And so, in my cosmology, there's all of that. It's not just like one thing. And I also, I think some of it's local. I think some of it's from elsewhere. So I wonder if you have some sort of, like, I'm curious about your worldview. Oh, I can sum it up real quick. Mm. Ignorance is bliss. (laughs) I don't know shit about any of that. None. (laughs) I, um, I, I, I didn't have the benefit of growing up in the Shire. I grew up I grew up in mm-hmm. a real life Bruce Springsteen song. <laughs> My worldview I grew up in the setting of the movie The Deer Hunter. Okay. Right. It was old church ladies, it was bikers, it was it was it was very much that. Mm-hmm. Um, nobody was talking about any of those things. My religious upbringing was Christian to a point I didn't do well in Sunday school. I didn't get through the first day. I was disruptive in that, you know, like you have little kids do like exercises to focus them and get them settled and it's fun. And that, you know, then it's, it's not sit down and listen. Right. So that exercise in the beginning, the first day of Sunday school was reach up and grab a cloud and bring it down and hold it in your hands. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. You can't do that. Clouds are cl- clouds. You can't hold it. You know, it's like I'll suspend the disbelief and say I could reach one. It's fine. We're exercising. <laughs> but like, you can't hold the cloud. You can't do it. And they told my mom that, like, this isn't going to work out. <laughs> so I joined my grandmother, who was the organist. So I'd go with her and I'd sit up in the loft above and behind the church and I didn't buy it because I felt like I was behind the curtain and I saw the gimmick and I knew how the scam worked. Yeah. I don't know why I was like thinking I was being scammed, but it wasn't for me. I wasn't a part of that. Mm -hmm. And I decided that early. So there was no spirituality in my life. I didn't realize my parents were as spiritual as they were until I was older because I didn't even recognize it. Mm. So I had no connection 
my worldview was very much the material things that were around me and the, the rat race of mm-hmm. living in New Jersey. I couldn't, I wasn't good at sports. I wasn't, um, I didn't have a like, parent that could set me up with a job and I just needed to be like funny to survive and kind of carve out a, a place uh, that's really important in that part of the world is to be able to, you know, make fun and laugh at yourself even, you know? Mm, yeah. So that's, then that might, that might turn into like some degree of cynicism. So there just was no room for any, anything that wasn't clearly made for entertainment, mm. which I dug. Yeah. <laughs> And how, so so how has that world view shifted? You mentioned, you know, that it did, that this changed your worldview. Yeah. So it changed in that I actually listen to people and don't just write them off. You know, to be honest, like your story would be harder for me to take seriously or grasp or even roll around in my head 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Nowadays, listen, I, you know, get practice listening to people talk in the group yeah. you know and the ground rules as they are uh helps with that mm-hmm. you know this is what people are experiencing this is how they're seeing things it's just information to me it's just ones and zeros mm-hmm. and take them in mm-hmm. take them in remember them reference them it, it all subconsciously adds up and, and that's just by being open to it mm-hmm. you know i don't have to start following somebody i don't need to believe them that's not the point right that coupled with you know i i was raised in a conservative family uh, i turned 40 this year and more and more conservative goes and as the guy living in america that's not typical. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's a different kind of influence, you know. And then it might be a little cliche to say, but like, I cannot kill an ant, step on a fly, mm-hmm. kill a spider. I rescue them mm-hmm. and I relocate them. Um, I throw away my neighbor's rat traps. <laughs> throw away. The, the the little like rat poison boxes like it really bothers me mm-hmm. um i had the neighborhood kids checking on have a heart traps that my other neighbor has in his backyard for red squirrels for what reason i don't know but he would you know drown them mm-hmm. and i had the kids like check regularly in the summer and let me know if he caught any and then i'd go over and let him go uh-huh. um because it's a like a the this the idea of something being killed in that way uselessly mm-hmm. and unnecessarily hurts yeah yeah on for for i i don't understand why that is why that's different mm-hmm. um i would have just said that guy's that guy's nuts mm-hmm. you know and just left it at that yeah like, that guy likes that guy that guy over there watch out he likes killing things mm-hmm. right now it's like i can't i can't live in the same world Mm. wow and that's like an extreme kind of silly example but that's what i chalk that up to yeah that's how 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 much change there's been right no i don't think it's i mean as you're talking i don't think it's a silly example because as you're talking i'm thinking about what you can't quite see but when I built this dome and I was stuccoing the inside, there were two uh, paper wasp nests and they hung out with me all summer, you know, and they were in yeah. between the, the bricks and all I would have had to done was just stuck her over the top of them. They just would have yeah. been entombed. And instead I have a hole in my ceiling because <laughs> I couldn't bear to do it. I just couldn't bear to do it. So they just wintered over with me and they slowly i don't know if it was better that they were trapped in the house with me they they kind of have slowly died off the last one just died but its body is on my altar wow sitting on padma sambhava's wow. lap like 
I can't, I get it. I hear you. I'm, I'm, it's, it, I don't know what it is, but yeah. And in that respect for that. Yeah. yeah. But you shared a, a space. Hmm. You guys shared a, a, a physical space for a, months and they didn't bother you. Nope. Right. They're very they docile. No. In fact, they would come and, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I guess nothing sounds crazy at this point, but they would come and ask for water and for honey and, you know, and I would put it out for them and yeah. I have a deep relationship. I, in the next year or two, I intend to install one of those indoor beehives, you know, that is like inside and there's oh, a yeah. hole where they can with like the, right above my tubes bed. tubes that go in and out? Yeah. 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 Like oh. right behind my bed, you know, so I can just be with the, the humming. So I, I had a bee or I'm sorry, a yellow jacket mm. colony in my wall. Wow. And at night, at night in the summer, it's still hot. Yeah. And they do their like they do their air conditioning thing. Uh-huh. Their natural AC is them just buzzing away. Yeah. And that is really scary. Scary. It's scary because mm. they, you just because they're just on the other side of a depleted piece of drywall that is like <laughs> paper thin at that point. Yeah. <laughs> so funny funny story and I had to get them out of the house mm-hmm. because they were swarming. Yeah. And they, they'll go after the you. Neighbor. Yellow jackets are different than little paper wasps. Like yes. they'll, they'll go after yes. you. Yes. My, Oh God, this is such a bad story, but I think we're too far into it. My neighbors saw the yellow jackets coming out by their porch. Mm-hmm. So they called an exterminator and they sprayed they retreated to my side and they found a, a hole that was in my ceiling from a hanging plant. Mm-hmm. And the thing is that when they retreat the poison, they look for daylight. Mm-hmm. So they found daylight. So they started coming through the ceiling. So I was at work and I told my son, I was like, he's like, the house is filling up with bees. My wife called me. She's like, the house is full of bees. <laughs> You need to come home right now. So I told my son, I was like, dude, get the vacuum, take the hose <laughs> and stand there and hold it right over the hole. Yeah. And I said, they, they will not get out of the way of the vacuum. Mm-hmm. And I said, and open the doors and anything in the house will screw and will go outside. Yeah. He learned that they deplete drywall. If they build a nest and it touches drywall, it will just turn to paper. Mm. He, he put the tube up to the hole and it went through the ceiling oh my God. and thousands of yellow oh jackets poured into the house. Yeah. So it, uh, it was bad. It was very yeah. bad. I filled up two vacuums. Wow. Yeah. yeah. It, was, it was, it was intense. Um, but they're in a better place. And I say, I'm I'm grateful that they chose my house. Mm-hmm. Um, I I'm trying to figure out what lesson that was. Right. How long ago um, was that? Uh, five or seven years. It was mm-hmm. before my awakening. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> we'll leave it there. But I just I you know I put it out there to the universe that I don't want them to come back. Right. Right. And they yeah. haven't. Good. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's a different situation than my couple little paper wasps that are so. Docile. But it's weird that I. You know what? It's weird though that like now I do feel like I feel bad that that happened. Mm-hmm. And I, you know what I learned is that this this is very much your previous podcast. I forgot the guest's name. Great voice. Was it Yoni? Such. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He's great. Such such a great voice. He. And you were talking about getting through to the afterlife mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and hell mm-hmm. and having to, you know, the, the, the thing about reliving your life flashing before your eyes yeah, and how like the purpose is that you need to feel what you need to feel. Mm-hmm. You need to go back and process things that you hadn't processed right. and maybe people that you hurt, mm-hmm. people that hurt you. Wouldn't you know, I got right on Instagram and DM my ex-girlfriend. 
mm-hmm. 20 years ago. Oh and it was God. like, I'm like, listen, we're cool. Cause she had sent me something a while back mm-hmm. and I totally ignored it. She was like appreciative of me being there during a certain time. That was very difficult. Mm. And I saw that and I was just like, fuck this. <laughs> right. yeah. I wasn't being honest with my, I wasn't being honest with myself mm-hmm. and uh, I didn't reach out. And um, she was like, wow, I really appreciate that. That's cool. Good on you. Like, we're both not thinking negative thoughts. Mm. And the best part is now when I die, I don't have to relive that relationship. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> that is amazing. Like, That's yeah, amazing. It's totally, totally, totally resolved. Ugh. And I can get to Valhalla much quicker. Or right. Right. Oh, the, my God. It's the next life. Yeah. That's amazing. I love that. I love that. Cause I've had that. I mean, you heard the podcast. I've had the experience. It's like, yeah. feel it now as deep as we can. And yeah, yeah. don't what, let's not have deathbed regrets if, if possible. I think it does make hell shorter. Wow. You know, he's going to be so excited to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Cause it, that's amazing. I have a big question. For, well, I have, first of all, I have two things to say just in response to your whole story. And then I have a really big off the wall question for you. That's kind of putting you on the spot and Ooh, goody. it'll, uh, we can cut it out if you don't, if you're like, no, I don't want to talk about it. Um, one of them, one of the things I want to say is just to note the dream about the cafeteria and the dead. Right. Yeah. I mean, I just want to put out there that like cafeterias, bus stations, the post office, like these are places that I've um, dreamed of the dead. And I don't know what that is, but that sort of limbo gathering space of some kind where people come and go from. Um, So when you said cafeteria, that's what it made me think of. It's like, oh, this is one of those places. All right. Do you want to know why I think that's my place? Yes, I do. I I think because I've thought about it a lot. Mm -hmm. Now, I learned how to swim at the YMCA in Perth Amboy, New Jersey. It was ancient. The pool was, I think, underground. There were no windows, mm. right? There was like an old brass bar that went around it. And yeah, it, anyway, I was there in preschool. It was part of my preschool program that we went there to learn how to swim. So I was very young. I shared that space with very old naked guys in the locker room. (laughs) And I think that that association is being young and very old Mm -hmm. and that there's a, a, there's, even though you're on opposite ends of a lifetime, they're holding hands on the other side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That, so that's, that's why I think I'm in the cafeteria at the YMCA. When you, when you, when you uh, interact with the dead. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. The other one, I just, it's a silly thing, but it's just one of those little things that happened today is I was telling someone about how I had a little moment that I've had many times. Um, and I'm very, very, I'm, I'm understanding now that it's sort of a kind of mellow kind of trauma response, but when things get uncomfortable or I start to feel kind of sticky or itchy, I just want to go. I want to get in my truck and go camping and go out to the middle of nowhere, which I've, which I do. Uh, And now I'm understanding that it's just like this reaction to want to go. And I was talking about how I like to go to this specific place that's in the Comanche National Grasslands. And it is just a high point. And I like to go and camp there because I can see the horizon 360 degrees around me. And I was, you know, I think that's the first time that I ever expressed that was earlier today. And so hearing you describe the same thing, it was sort of like, I just want to see everything. Yeah, it was interesting. Yeah, yeah, I declared that to myself recently. Mm. Um, I think after a trip to uh, the high desert in California, Mm -hmm. uh, I was like, I need to be somewhere where the horizon is accessible yeah. because living in the Northeast, the hills are old and flattened and the horizon is your neighbor's maple tree. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, even like I work on the third floor of a building and the horizon is the next parking lot 
adjacent to that property. Like yeah. I need a horizon because I, I think clearly mm. I can, you know, and I have a, a little tiny place on Cape Cod mm -hmm. and it's, it's very near Cape Cod Bay and it's equally as near to the sound to mm -hmm. Martha's Vineyard and there, it's wide open. Even the beaches are flat. It takes like a mile to get to the water, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. So it's, it's, her, it's, it's a place to decompress. It's a place where I can find that clarity. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, visiting the desert, I was like, I love it here. And others were like, well, it's, kind of sucks there's a desert and i was like no it's beautiful right. you could just see far this is essential yeah distance yeah. yeah it's the only thing that exists is the sky and the ground you know and you can see all yeah. of it you can see a whole circle yeah. if you if you roll your head around yeah it's amazing yeah and it's it's quiet mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah all right here's my last kind of just throwing it out there question for you. And I'm only asking it because I know a little bit of the story beforehand. But I'm curious how, if you have any thoughts about how the feminine, particularly the divine feminine, yeah. fits into the phenomenon, if at all. Yeah. So this is something that I can relate to because during my teenage years, I had a dream and it changed me like flipping a switch mm -hmm. and the change that happened was i felt like my earthly trauma had been taken away yeah. and immediately i had empathy i had appreciation where before i had bitterness and jealousy and was very cynical and was pretty mean. Um, when I was 16, I was more than a typical jerk for that age. Mm -hmm. um, I really carried like hate in my heart for where I was and having to sit in the school and classroom with people that were morons mm -hmm. and feeling trapped and not caring about these people. It was immediately different. My friends noticed in the cafeteria mm -hmm. that I was different and they're like, why are you acting this way? <laughs> and I was like, I just had this dream. I just had this dream. I just feel better. And isn't it great? Isn't this great? Mm -hmm. And they're like, explain the dream. So I said, okay, sure. You're going to think it's silly. So it was in my hometown. There is a pond slash lake. It's not very big, but you could, you can go fishing there and catch some catfish. And it took about 15 minutes to walk around. In the dream, there was an island and there was a house connected by a bridge. The house, okay, rewind a little bit. I was an angry 16-year-old metalhead. Hmm. And the more aggressive and the more complex the music, the more progressive the music, the better. Because hmm. that made me feel. I could relate to it. The, whether it was a monotonous, heavy riff or beat, that was my place of zen. I found calmness in that. And then the subject matter was always something gnarly, right? So I appreciated the lyrical component of it. My girlfriend at the time was super into Tori Amos. So naturally, I called her Turdy Anus. <laughs> and anytime she wanted to listen to it, I reminded her of that and was like, that's bullshit. Never gave it a chance. I borrowed, I don't, I don't know why, I don't know what made me do it, but I borrowed the CD of hers, Little Earthquakes, and I listened to it one night, probably because I thought it was chill music and I wanted to chill out. So I listened to it on headphones, laying in bed uh, in a dark room, and my mind was blown that the, her chord choices and progressions were 
really unique. Her voice was intriguing. And I thought the subject matter was metal as fuck. (laughs) It was so dark and Mm -hmm. so unnerving and made me feel like I didn't belong in the same room. It made me uncomfortable. So it was great. I listened to it twice around. And I was like, okay, I get it. Like, this is like feminine metal. That's what's happening here with just a piano. Like, wow, my mind is blown. So I had this ultimate respect for her. Here's the dream. There's an island. There's a house on it. With a placard that said, this is the childhood home of Tori Amos. I was like, okay, cool. I'll check it out. Walked in. There's nobody else there. Walked in. It's a classic colonial. Uh, your entrance, your stairway straight up to the second floor, a room to the left, a room to the right, a hallway, back to a kitchen or bathroom, something like that. So I started up the stairs. And as I got to the top of the stairs, to my right was one of the bedrooms on the second floor. and. I knew somebody was in there, and I knew it was her, but it wasn't really her. It was this overwhelming feminine energy. And as I got to the landing, the door was open. I couldn't even look. I I couldn't, like, set eyes in the room. I, like, fell to the floor and just started, like, weeping. I was just overwhelmed. I wasn't afraid, you know, it wasn't like, you know, like, oh my God, it's BTS. I'm crying. Right. (laughs) It was just like overwhelming emotion. And I hid behind an open door, like against the wall. And there was lipstick on the floor and it was green shag carpeting. And I wrote out the word fromage Hmm. in the carpet. And I heard a voice from inside the room say, pleasantly, cheese. And I was put at ease. Mm -hmm. And I stood up and I walked into the room and she was there. But again, it wasn't really her. It just kind of the representation. It was, you know, fiery hair and uh, form. And um, that's it. That's all I recall. And then I woke up and I was different and I kind of laughed about it. My friends kind of laughed about it. It's like, like, oh, you know, Jim just had this like psychotic break, but look, he's a nice (laughs) guy now. Like, you know, like, like, all right, cool. It wasn't until very recently this year, I was listening to uh, Chris Bledsoe's son's podcast and it was the, an episode about a regression that he had done and he He's taken to this divine presence. And, you know, I didn't go to Egypt. I didn't see Hathor, this goddess, and all that. So the removal of trauma, he specifically said, and the feeling of being overwhelmed by this, like, love and emotion was very much the same. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, I was like, wow. Is that what that was? Did did I experience that? And now I don't I'm not really read up on it, but I see that it's connected to, you know, like the Lady of the Lake, and again the imagery of, the, of her being in the middle of a lake. Like it's like if I wasn't so bad at school, I might have picked up on that detail. You know, <laughs> like they were trying to make a point, and I was just like, that album was great. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I thinking of it now, like I, 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 yeah, I think very much that there is this feminine element somehow wrapped up in the phenomenon, mm-hmm. which is weird because I don't think there's any type of masculine counterpart mm-hmm. that I've seen. Wow. Well, thank you so much know. for sharing that. I got chills. I teared up a little. Thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah, it really was great. And it's kind of cool to think of it in another way other than just like this wacky dream about Tori Amos. Right. Because at face value, that just sounds like it makes no sense. Well, that, I mean, the the imagery of the dream, but the profound thing was the change, right? Like the, that's what yeah. gives it the weight is just the something, just there was a huge shift with it. Yeah. It was immediate. It was immediate. And I mean, the other fun fact is that I met my wife in a Tori Amos message board oh, wow. in the early <laughs> aughts. <laughs> You remained a loyal fan. <laughs> I certainly did. So there was purpose to it. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. They, the goddesses have shown up for me in not shown up for me, but like they're here, they're part of this. And uh, it was incredibly unexpected. I really, yeah. you know, it's like mantis beings and ETs and all this stuff. And then these, then the goddesses show up and the feminine and, uh, there's a lot to that that I'm still unpacking, but a lot to do with what we've culturally pushed down into kind of the shadow realm and mm -hmm. reckoning with that and redefining and reintegrating what even the feminine is or means to me has been a huge part of this journey, uh, a like major turning point of this journey for me. It helped me touch the emotions and the grief and um, rage and things that I had really pushed away. So that's amazing. I love that story so much and thank you for sharing it. I appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. I, I, I think about that dream now and the, that emotion mm -hmm. I felt, even though it was overwhelming, it was so real. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, to, to, I've had that feeling again. My wife and I had been going through some real shit um in the past couple of years mm -hmm. and i had a dream that her and i left this planet in a brass bubble and we went to our planet it was ours it was very small small like the little prince small it was so far away from its star it was so dimly lit and it was purple and the ground was crunchy but being in that place was home mm -hmm. and i felt that feeling it was so strong it was so powerful that when i woke up i was just saying like no mm. like i need to get back i need to get back to whatever that was yeah that's where i need to be and it was it was so hard to wake up and face this reality at that moment because I felt like I had a taste of that other place. It's evoking memories of of waking up into this reality from another place that feels like home. It's rough. Yeah, it sucks. Yeah, it does. It does. <laughs> but it's, but I, but there's still a feeling like this is there's there's a reason. Yeah. It doesn't feel like. Um, I'm being robbed of anything because I feel like that other place is accessible. I just think that it's outside of time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's right. like things that, you know, I wish I, uh, as a kid, any regrets you have, you know, it's like, why, well, if I just practice throwing a fucking baseball three <laughs> hours a day, I'd, I could be a pitcher. Yeah. I'd be on the Yankees and I'd, I'd be retired already. Right. <laughs> I just did that, right? Because that's time lost. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. But this feeling of this place feels outside of time. It feels like it's accessible. And whether it's when you die or what, I don't know, just even, I don't know, maybe I'll figure it out tomorrow. Right, right. But yeah. it feels like it's right there. Yes. Yep. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you. This is great. For more information about Jim's podcast, The Clueless Experiencer, or to connect with him directly on Twitter, check the show notes. Our musical soundscapes are by Morgan Jenks. You can support his new album on Bandcamp or find out more information at morganjenks.com. And finally, to book a one-on-one -on -one session with me or to share your own account, 
visit honeyheart.org.